I feel like I'm living in the future in a way, you know, and, and that's, that's the, that's the beauty of places like El Zante or uh, Bitcoin jungle, or I hadn't been to Bitcoin Ikazi, it, but it's, it's all these communities that are like kind of like agricultural yeah. or it, you, you go there and you're like, oh, wow. It's like, they're so not advanced uh, because they don't have the same infrastructure and stuff. But then you're, you're living in the future in a place that looks like the past kind of, it's, it's just a phenomenal thing. Francis, we finally got you here in El Zante in the studio. Stoked yep. to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks, Mike. So uh, what'd you think of the Adopting Bitcoin conference? Oh, I love it. It's one of my favorite Bitcoin conferences. Um, Did you go last year? I went last year and uh, yeah, I think this was my second time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's great. Um, people from all over the world, the the energy is always very high here. People are, um, you know, it's it's kind of a... Uh, it's, it's very positive. The vibes are very positive here. And uh, I think you get to meet a lot of people that work in the the, lo the local Bitcoin communities around the world tend to tend to come here. So you can, you know, get to meet people that I don't meet at other t types of events. Yeah, I, I love the way even they do like the the speaker kind of lineup. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of people that maybe you've never heard of before that are doing amazing things. Yeah. They don't have, you know, just the same big names that you yeah, know, right. usually do the the Bitcoin circuit. You yeah. get to hear from a lot of fresh and interesting people. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's really important for all these communities that are all over the world to kind of like connect, share their experiences, learn, build networks. Um, you know, there's no there's no like one Bitcoin citadel where everybody's going to move to and we're not going to, you know, start our own country somewhere. Uh, there's a decentralized nexus of, of these groups. And uh, through these kinds of events, you know, we get to uh, to build a um, kind of a decentralized network of communities, which is just fantastic to see. Um, they've just been growing so much. There was a specific presentation by Giacomo and Roxy about uh, the Plan B network, um, an initiative to kind of share resources and ideas amongst these groups. And they were showing this slide about the growth of new local Bitcoin communities. And I think Roxy said that at this rate, there is one a week that's, really? pop that's popping up all over the world. Um, so just fantastic to hear. Yeah, it's it's amazing, you know, having having kind of been focused on this and yeah. for a while, and then things will just pop up. I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, I didn't know that was yeah. you know already so far along. You yeah. hear all these new things. Even at this conference, there was we went out to dinner one night with all the circular Bitcoin economy like groups, and it was amazing. I think we had like 30 people there in the room. Yeah, and and that you know obviously a lot of a lot of the other groups weren't able to make it to El Salvador, but that was just the ones at this conference. Yeah. So it's been, uh, yeah, that, that for me has been very inspiring. Also seeing, you know, they had the, I don't know what the, the hall where people can get booths and stuff. And most of the companies in there this year were all Salvadoran companies. So you're seeing all these, you know, homegrown Bitcoin efforts growing up in this space. And, there, and there's definitely more locals, I think. Uh, I think that was, that was my impression. There was a lot more locals um, getting involved this year than, than the previous year. So that's really good to see. Yeah, you heard even a lot more Spanish being spoken yeah. throughout the, yeah, you know, the conference. So yeah. it, was, it was a lot of fun. I love too, and that conference is just very Bitcoin only and in a yeah. like non-commercial way. Not that there aren't companies there and, and you know, commercial projects, but it just feels more genuine. It doesn't feel like people are trying to sell you stuff. No, absolutely. And I mean, of course, like a lot of Bitcoin companies, uh, you know, they make profits, you know, they sell services, uh, exchange and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, me personally, for example, like if I'm coming here, I'm not looking for like ROI, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, I know I'm not going to uh, be, you know, e even entering the Salvadoran market, it's a small market, you know, the people are not super wealthy. So um, the people who come here, you can see that they're just genuinely interested in, um, not getting an ROI, but really like participating and giving back. So it's definitely yeah. a different vibe than, you know, like Bitcoin Miami and those kind of conferences. No, that part's super clear because when you dive in it with these companies, they're like, hey, we'll probably never make money here. Yeah. But we see this as being so important that yeah. we want to make sure we're here helping and we're participating. And, yeah. and a lot of them see, too, this is a place that they can, you know, 
reach the broader Latin American market. Yeah. That El Salvador is a very friendly jurisdiction to yeah. locate in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's been encouraging for me. I, I love this conference just because it, it, it doesn't feel doesn't feel like work. It feels like yeah. you're just hanging out with friends. You're yeah. just having a good time. Um, yeah. You see so many people you want to spend time with. That's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the one downside is you uh -huh. uh, not enough hours in the day. Yeah. So, and you are staying in El Zante for a couple days or? Only today, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I love El Zante. I'm a surfer. I love the, the vibe here. I love the beach here. I wish I could stay longer. Uh, I'll definitely be coming back often here. Yeah. So well, it's not too far of a flight no, from uh, no, no, where you're it's, at. It's so. not too bad. So tell us a little bit about your Bitcoin story, like yeah. how you got into the space, how you started Bull Bitcoin, you know, how how that got set up. Yeah. Um I was originally a kind of like public policy, policy analyst, politics guy, economics guy. I was working for a think tank um producing like economic reports. And um, I became, in my youth, quite libertarian. I'm kind of like the Ron Paul generation where, you know, I grew up in my, my teens watching. So was that something, did you go to university to, to? I did actually. And I was lucky enough in university to have Austrian economics professors. Uh, really? Totally randomly. I went to a King's College in London and it just turns out that the political science department was full of Austrian economists and libertarians. So um, I was introduced to Hayek, Mises, Rothbard, um, uh, Novak, uh, all sorts of, you know, libertarian free market authors in university. And at the time also, um, there was, uh, uh, Ron Paul, the election and all that. Um, so I, I developed this, this, this interest for free market economics and, uh, started working for economic free market think tank in Montreal. And I was introduced to Bitcoin by fellow libertarians. It's through the libertarian movement that I was introduced first to Bitcoin. And I had friends that were, um, this was in 2013, early Bitcoin adopters. And they um, had an idea, which was that there was a lot of Bitcoiners in Quebec, but at the time, Bitcoin was perceived as being uh, only for drugs and for bad things. I mean, that is no longer the case today, realistically speaking. Some people still think that. But at the time in 2013, if you were a Bitcoiner, you were immediately suspicious. And it was hard to find people to talk in person about Bitcoin. Um, and uh, these guys were like, listen, why don't we create a physical space in, in Quebec where we're going to share an office, we're going to share um, resources, and we're gonna just like get Bitcoiners to to interact in in person. I think also the idea was um, um, we didn't really have anybody to talk to about about Bitcoin. So these guys created a, a, a physical office space, um, very similar to Bitcoin Park in in Nashville. Actually, it's probably but this the, was in 2013. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And this was called the Bitcoin Embassy. Um, we were lucky enough that there was a the owner of a building that was a Bitcoiner, and he said, "Listen, this building is not, you know, I don't." I, I don't need the rent money. It's downtown Montreal. So um, I'll give you the building if you promise to like make something cool um, for, for Bitcoin. He was a Bitcoin believer. So we created this uh, nonprofit organization slash physical space called the Bitcoin Embassy. And uh, I, was, uh, I was hired by these guys to be kind of like the public relations, public affairs guy. My job was um, to try to like create a brand image or a narrative around Bitcoin, um, which would dispel the myths. And uh, our, our goal generally was, you know, to make sure that the government doesn't crack down on us, right? It's like, okay, so we need to start putting positive messages for Bitcoin out there. Um, we don't want people to think that um, this is just an illegal, uh, uh, you know, money laundering operation. Um, so I became kind of like a public affairs guy and I started to run the Bitcoin meetup in Montreal. We opened the co-working space. We opened an office space. Um, we had like a little hardware lab. Um, so it was a, a beautiful kind of like um, community center for Bitcoiners. Um, Bitcoiners from all over. It, it, it sounds a little bit like what's happening in, Zal in El Zante in the sense that uh, Bitcoiners from all over the world would just like come to Montreal to visit us. and. Um, we ended up organizing a lot of events and a lot of collaboration between Bitcoin companies was happening there. So it was like a really exciting time. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, I actually got in the first place in Bitcoin through nonprofit community building activities. And then at some point, you know, 
uh, we had a physical help desk. So that was that was uh, okay. the, the second iteration of the project. We started as a just like an office space for Bitcoiners, but then we had Bitcoin signs on the outside. So people would just like knock on the door and like, what is this place? Like, what is Bitcoin? I'm curious, you know, I see Bitcoin signs and we were kind of like closed off to the public. So it was like, why don't we like dedicate a part of the space to have this um, almost like a, like a, Public inter public information kiosk is the best the best way to put it. So um, I spent I don't know how many years, maybe two and a half years, sitting on a desk um, facing the street, and uh, people would walk in. They would uh, ask questions about Bitcoin. We would set them up with wallets. Um, we had uh, you know selling Bitcoin T-shirts and gadgets and so on and so forth. And um, the number one question uh, that people ask is like, where can I buy Bitcoin? Where can I buy Bitcoin? Um, so. I was and, saying, and at that time, what was like, how were people buying Bitcoin? What was the easiest way? I mean, at that time, it was basically in the early beginning, it was like, well, you can wire some money to Mt. Gox. Um, and it was it was not easy. It was shady. It was complicated. It Could was, you even wire it to Mt. Gox? For some reason, I remember when I looked into it, you had to like send like a cashier's check or yeah, something it, like it, that. It was all sorts of convoluted, complicated yeah. setups. Um, and, uh, you know, it... Uh, that that's that's why eventually I started bull Bitcoin. It was because I kept referring people to these exchanges that kept just just really sucking, you know. And uh, these were all obviously like you know custodial shitcoin casinos. Already they were their shitcoins at the time, and um, I uh, I felt bad referring people to like go on these exchanges because I was like, well, they're they're probably going to go on the exchange. They're probably going to leave their Bitcoins there and they're probably going to invest in a bunch of crap. And um, so that's why I built Bull Bitcoin. I was like, I want people to be able to go to an exchange where for certain, the like the user experience is going gonna, is gonna to push them towards becoming long-term yeah. holders and self-custody. So, so that's the origin story. I didn't realize, uh, I love hearing this history. I didn't realize there was that much activity in Montreal. And I, I, from my impression of, of Canada, specifically mm -hmm. of Quebec, mm -hmm. uh, I don't picture libertarian leaning Bitcoiners. So it's for me, it's very fascinating to hear that 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 was the nexus for all this. It's uh, it's it's very difficult to explain how and why there was such a high concentration of Bitcoiners in in Quebec and Canada in 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 general. Um, people ask me this all the time, like, why is there so many Canadian Bitcoiners? Like, why is there so many Bitcoiners coming out of Quebec, specifically given what we know about generally the Canadian kind of culture and mindset, which is not at all the same as the American freedom loving mindset? I can't answer why, but uh, there definitely was a very large concentration of Bitcoin early adopters um, uh, in, uh, in Quebec, um, which is, you know, why the Bitcoin embassy was so successful. We, we, we ran it from 2013 to 2017. Um, running a physical Bitcoin hub is, uh, it's not, it's not easy. It's very, yeah. it's very tiring. Um, there's, uh, there's all sorts of considerations regarding, you know, security, safety, um, you know, we have to vet people to make sure they're not scammers, shit corners. All, so it was a lot of energy. So we, we eventually closed it down in 2017, um, just before the bull run. And actually I'm quite happy that we did because it would have been very difficult for us to uh, to go through a bull run because you know um, the the first bull run in 2013 just after we opened like people would like come to the office and scream I want to buy Bitcoin this thing's going up like blah blah you know and people were freaking out and then price crashes people call you it, it, it's it was very intense yeah um, but it was um, what I learned from this experience is that the physical proximity of Bitcoiners um, in in one space creates magical results creates wonders um we are an online community we know each other from twitter from you know all sorts of telegram groups so on and so forth but uh being in a physical space and and uh it it just um creates a lot of innovation you know and creates a lot of uh of um tr ironically bitcoin is a is a trust minimized trustless system but um being able to trust other people in the Bitcoin space um, makes it, you know, um, a lot, a lot easier um, to build Bitcoin projects and Bitcoin companies. Um, so I, I really got the the feeling that uh, physical Bitcoin hubs were were important to Bitcoin, and um, and I think today uh, we're seeing a resurgence of, of this concept, uh, spe especially after after COVID and after the last um, couple of years, where the kind of cultural or ideological differences between Bitcoiners and 
and other types of people started to 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 widen or become more apparent. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of everybody knows that COVID has been, uh, you know, and and not just COVID, but a general trend toward globalism, central plan, surveillance state, you know, um, um, mainstream media propaganda, kind of like the 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 tail end of the the fiat era, yeah. you know. Um, has been dividing people, and I think Bitcoiners have started to kind of like tribalize a little bit, which is which is good because um, you know we we are stronger and more united as a, as a tribe. So I'm seeing this kind of like resurgence where Bitcoin is uh, Bitcoin is uh, it's just a money, it's just a technology, but there is also a a cultural uh, phenomenon behind Bitcoin, an intellectual ideological phenomenon, and um, Bitcoiners. Um, find themselves to be uh, uh, more comfortable and uh, more uh, productive when surrounded by other Bitcoiners. So, yeah. so that's, that's just, it's a, it's a pretty efficient filter I've seen. Yeah, like it, it's, yeah. it, we've seen this in El Salvador that it brings people together and 99% of the time, they're not even talking about Bitcoin, but they just find yeah. that they, they don't agree on everything, but yeah. on the, you know, the deeper, more important issues, they tend to line up. And so yeah. they just feel comfortable. People that have just met for the first time yeah. feel like this is like a friend they've known forever. Yeah. I mean, at very minimum, Bitcoiners believe in self-sovereignty. They believe in personal responsibility. Even if you don't believe in personal responsibility, generally, like as a Bitcoiner, you have no choice, yeah. right? Because if you lose your keys, you lose your wealth. So, so, so personal responsibility becomes whether you like it or not, um, you know, a value or driving principle of your life. Well, it pushes people that way too. Yeah. People that have come in that were wired differently. I've seen a lot of people that were very like left yeah. leaning, yeah. thinking the state needed to do these things. And when they're introduced to Bitcoin, it just slowly pulls them away from that. And they realize it's yeah. like the, you know, the the shade that was like in front of their eyes is like lifted up and they're like, oh, wow, yeah. this is this all sounded good, but really it's creating, you know, much more harm than good. Yeah. What's also cool about Bitcoiners is um, we have hope for the future. That's why we're in Bitcoin, right? Because we believe that uh, the future is going to be better because of Bitcoin and that there is something that we can do to make the future better. Whereas people who are not aware of Bitcoin or who are dismissive of Bitcoin or who are just like busy, you know, doing their own lives, I, I feel like there is a certain pessimism, you know, whether it's whether it's climate change. That's that's a big theme that I've seen. Pe people are very convinced that the world is is heading in a bad direction, and that uh, there's not much hope. You know, people are very pessimistic. Even it comes like a doomsday religion yeah. for them. They're so yeah. welded wedded to that that narrative yeah. that they actually don't want it to not be true. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. It like defines them. Uh, absolutely. There's, there's also a uh, kind of like victimhood mentality going on here. Uh, we've seen it with, you know, all sorts of so, so, so social issues. Um, people uh, also, I, I see a lot of like cultural guilt, you know, uh, where uh, we, we've ruined the world. And whereas in the Bitcoin space, everybody's focused on building something for the future. And as Bitcoiners, because we, believe in low time preference because we have and we own sound money and we understand sound money we understand that the future will be brighter for us um and that uh we there is tangible things that we can build to make this future brighter for us and for our kids um one thing i noticed at this conference and generally speaking i would be very interested in the statistical deviation of the birth rate <laughs> amongst Bitcoiners versus there the- There seems to be a baby boom in the Bitcoin community. There there for sure is, it's it's striking. Um, there was a lot of pregnant ladies at the conference, a lot of young babies. And uh, every Bitcoiner that I talked to, is, uh, and, and it's funny because when you, when you have Bitcoin, you understand that uh, the Bitcoin that you have currently are all things considered going to be more, more valuable in the future. And that, um, uh, your your kids will benefit from those bitcoins way more than way more than you will you know so um, I can you know I can buy a car with this bitcoin today or my um, my son can launch a business with with bitcoin uh, without seed investment in in 20 25 years and there's also this thought of you know um, if I'm if I'm a hodler I don't want to sell bitcoin so what happens you know what happens if I die you know who's going to get those bitcoins I need to you know I need to have uh, kids 
because I need to pass them on to someone. I don't want to. I don't want to die with you know with my bitcoins and that not being uh, wor worth anything to anybody. Um, so so really interesting, different mindset. So it's a. Uh, Uh, the vibes are very positive and very high amongst amongst Bitcoiners. So that's one of the reasons why I love going to these types of events. Um, it's, it's just to be able to participate in this like very high vibe, energetic, optimistic group of people. I uh, mistakenly wound up uh, committed to, to speaking at a conference in Tulum that was a, a crypto conference. And yes. generally, I'd always say no, but there was a cool project, uh, Bitcoin Yucatan, that, mm -hmm. that's happening there. So I wanted to go visit them. So I was like, all right, mm. we'll show up. And it's just the vibe is so much different. Yeah. Right? I'm like, I forgot how scammy and how yeah. just different the outlook is on people at crypto conferences versus something like adopting Bitcoin. Yeah. And Bitcoiners get a lot of flack for the so-called toxic maximalism and uh, but what we've what we've been able to create in our communities it's a it's a, it's a filter that um, there crypto crypto scammers are are predatory in in nature they're they're looking for they're, they're looking for victims yeah they're looking for people to offload their backs to and um, I think we've we've built a culture which um, repels them quite successfully. I think that's that's one of the biggest that's one of my proudest achievements in Bitcoin. Actually, it's having been part of this cultural movement where we're just going to say no and make a differentiation. Bitcoin is not crypto, and uh, I think that's been very successful. And it's it's so refreshing to to have events like adopting Bitcoin. And um, you know, I generally would not go to an event that has that's not a Bitcoin only event. Um, there's a huge difference between crypto people and Bitcoiners. I can define it like this. Um, a crypto person will purchase a crypto uh, believing that they will be able to sell it for a higher price in the future. Which sounds a lot like Bitcoiners, but the way I see Bitcoiners is um, they're purchasing Bitcoin now because it is cheaper for themselves to buy it now than for their future self. The way that I see Bitcoin is, all right, um, you know, when I first got into Bitcoin, Um, I was a student, fresh student out of university, so I wasn't I, I wasn't wealthy by any means. Uh, I was a I was a wagey with a, you know, I was making a, like thirty five grand a year, you know. So uh, I would think like, all right, so Bitcoin's two hundred two hundred bucks or something. Um, it's gonna take me 10 hours to to create a Bitcoin uh, to to acquire a Bitcoin. Um, but in the future, if uh, if Bitcoin is ten thousand um, dollars, it's gonna cost me five hundred hours to accumulate a Bitcoin. If a Bitcoin is $100,000, it's going to take me 5,000 hours to accumulate a Bitcoin. So Bitcoiners are interested in acquiring Bitcoin now because they know they're going to want it in the future. They, they don't. They, we don't plan necessarily to sell it for fiat. Um, and also because we know that uh, Bitcoin is going to be, these Bitcoins are going to be uh, almost impossible for our kids to acquire in the future. Uh, huge difference uh, with crypto people who are um, you know, looking at it From an just a purely investment perspective, with fiat returns, um, yeah. Bit Bitcoiners also tend to use Bitcoin as their unit of account. Like the the goal is not to increase your stash of fiat. The goal the the the, the goal is to increase your absolute number of of Bitcoin units of of Bitcoins. Um, so yeah, um, a, a big a big cultural war going on between uh, the people who are trying to import the fiat mentality into the crypto space and the people who are trying to create something um, something new or maybe something uh, that that's old and we've forgotten um, I, I, th I think uh, the you know it it's, it's something new um, so yeah it's 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 great to be to be part not only in a technological and financial and monetary innovation but also a cultural revolution um, that is uh, you know we, we are the basically Bitcoiners are the new counterculture you know and, definitely yeah and, yeah and uh, Our life is just so much more enjoyable. You look at everybody. It is. You, you It's fun to be a Bitcoiner. It is. Yeah. It, so, 2000 was 2017. You started Bull Bitcoin. Yeah, I start. Well, I started Bull Bitcoin in 2015. It wasn't. Okay. It, it wasn't called Bull Bitcoin at the time. Um, I also. Um, and, and what was the like process behind that? You were just like, okay, nobody's doing this right, so I'm going to figure out how to do it right. I mean yeah. that. Yeah. You had to have been like figuring things out for the first time. No, it's not like other people were doing that in Canada, right? 
Well, um, we had this, uh, essentially we had this, this physical kiosk where people uh, would come to buy Bitcoin with cash in person. And we had like a Bitcoin ATM. Right? So, so my first experience with Bitcoin was running a Bitcoin ATM at this center and, you know, um, selling Bitcoin for cash. And uh, a lot of- Was it actually an ATM or you were like both, doing it physically? With both. Okay. Yeah, we had an ATM and we also had a, like a physical, like a kind of like currency exchange desk. Uh -huh. And um, people would uh, want to, people were flying from all over Canada because they knew that if they came to the Bitcoin embassy, they would have like, they would come in with dollars and they would leave with a non-custodial wallet with Bitcoins. You know, it was a kind of like a full hand-holding service. And people started to, um, you know, call us and say, hey, can I, can I send you money online? Can I, can I buy Bitcoins online? And I was like, no, well, you know, we're not really doing this as a professional operation. If you want, if you, if you want to come, you know, you bring some cash, we'll just sell you some Bitcoin. But like that demand um, kept, kept growing. So eventually we just said, all right, um, let's, let's just stop treating this as a, as a little, you know, side hustle um, and let's treat it as a business. And at the same time, I had a friend at the Bitcoin embassy who launched a bill payment company called Bills, B-Y-L-L-S. And that was the first uh, Bitcoin bill payment company in the world. Um, so very simple service where you want to pay like an electric bill, a credit card bill or something, taxes. You send Bitcoin to the app and the app will pay the bill for you. And um, he decided to close down the business in late 2015. And I was devastated. This was one of the first startups that the Bitcoin It just wasn't had. making money or he just it was, it was very something different? Or? It was very manual. It was, uh, it, it, it was, um, it was not a, a scalable project. Yeah. And, you know, he had been offered a job somewhere. And r running a Bitcoin business is, is very tough. It's very difficult uh, emotionally, energetically. Um, there's, you know... Being an entrepreneur is risky. Being a, being a Bitcoin entrepreneur is excessively risky. Um, and uh, he was just, I guess, done <laughs> doing that. He was offered a job. And between like 2013 and 20, uh, late 2015, whenever someone asked me like, what can you do with Bitcoin? I would say, well, you can pay all your bills with Bitcoin. That was like, like my default answer. So when he he said he was thinking about shutting it down, I was like, you can't shut this down. <laughs> like I gotta, uh, we gotta keep it alive. So I, I actually bought the the, the company, uh, I acquired the company off of him. Um, so so Bull Bitcoin started out originally, our first product was the bill, the bill payment product. And I developed an expertise in essentially being an online merchant, right? Because if you're, I'm accepting Bitcoin payments yeah. and the product I'm selling is, is, is bill payment. So. I ended up um, uh, developing this expertise in Bitcoin payment processing. And uh, something really interesting happened uh, around at the same time, the, the block size wars um, were starting to happen. I was already part of, I guess, the Bitcoin conference because I was running the Bitcoin embassy. So I was very involved amongst Bitcoin builders and, and Bitcoin companies. and. Um, I was I was uh, on uh, I don't, I'm not going to get too into details of the block size wars, but I was on the side of people who did not want to increase the block size, and I was on the the side of people who wanted Lightning Network. So, long story short, um, some people wanted uh, thought that Bitcoin would scale with the Lightning Network, and some people thought that Bitcoin would scale with bigger blocks, which today is what's known as Bitcoin Cash, uh, more or less. Um, so I was on the side of the uh, Lightning Network. Uh, people <laughs> and, uh, and and at that time and lightning network was was theoretical it wasn't yeah something it, it, that was, it did not it did not exist yeah. Se segwit did not exist the lightning network was purely theoretical and um uh, you know we all understood that it could work um and uh, as we know now i mean uh, it was manifested in reality through a lot of work and dedication. The the creation of the, light, the Lightning Network, the invention of the Lightning Network is not so complicated because it's just payment channels, but the creation of an entire ecosystem and global economy which runs over Lightning is uh, an in inconceivably amazing achievement. Um, nothing's, nothing like this has ever been done yeah. before in the history of finance. Like um, uh, in, in a very decentralized and grassroots way, by the way, there was no, uh, uh, there was no like lightning organization, lightning uh, group, which created lightning. It was a decentralized network of people which um, had converging interests to make it work, which collaborated. Some of them hated each other. Some of them hate each other. People in lightning, there's there's different, but it, at the end of the day, we all, we all want Bitcoin to succeed. So we ended up um, uh, building this uh, this network organically. 
I'm curious, yeah. does it look now like you thought it would look back then? Or is it Oof, rolled uh, out in a way that's that's different than you kind of envisioned? Surprisingly enough, I kind of I kind of imagined that the, the end the end product of scanning a QR code and the payment just working all, all, all the time, you know, and uh, uh, it it looks it looks surprisingly um, uh, on the surface what we thought it would uh, look like. Uh, I obviously the 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 dynamics of the network are not at all what I thought it would look like. Um, you know, I never imagined, you know, lightning service providers. I never imagined uh, full Bitcoin nodes running on your phone, like um, like with lightning dev kit and breeze and Phoenix and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I never imagined that it would be so sophisticated. Um, and uh, I also didn't imagine that it would be this hard yeah, to, it's to a build. Lot, I, I think it's a yeah. lot more complicated than people it envisioned is. at that yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of my also big realizations at the time was, okay, so I'm running this very small Bitcoin bill payment company called Bills, you know, very, very small, very niche. And um, I'm participating in those discussions about the future of Bitcoin and all the other Bitcoin companies there don't share, they don't share the community values at all. Um, they don't share the value of decentralization. They don't share the value of censorship resistance. They see Bitcoin as a commercial venture backed product. And uh, they're interested in in providing returns to their investors, and they're interested in acquiring users. Um, so that's when I realized, okay, we need Bitcoin companies to be advocates for the the ethos of of Bitcoin. Like we're not just building products; we are. Every Bitcoin company is kind of like a little little political party in a way, you know, um, try, trying to push forth the ideas and. In Bitcoin, um, there is no democracy. You don't vote, right? Um, but what you can do is by building infrastructure and products where your values are embedded in the product, um, you can kind of like steer the Bitcoin culture and the the um, the w the way that people interact with Bitcoin. You can you can bake in your own values in your products and make make that the default user experience. For, it's just just being Bitcoin only, for example. That's just one uh, obvious example. You know, if if you um, if you don't believe in uh, multiple currencies coexisting and, and, and competing and people rugging each other, you're just you know building a Bitcoin only exchange or Bitcoin, uh, building a, a non custodial exchange or building an exchange which allows for no KYC and, and those kinds of things, uh, building decentralized exchanges, uh, peer to peer exchanges. Um, so I came to the conclusion that um, you know Bitcoin companies needed to be strongly ideological entities and uh, you know the um, uh, uh, that comes at a cost of obviously profit because who's yeah. making profit in in the crypto space? I mean, it's it's all the all the shitcoin casinos. Well, I think right? especially at the time that you were starting, that's where you yeah. saw that divergence. Yeah. That you know, obviously the early adopters yeah. were more ideological, but at that time yeah. you had you know people that were more driven by by profit motives. So yeah. I'm sure you were kind of going against the tide a little bit. In, yeah, in yeah. The there was there, there was there was definitely not many of us, but we were more uh, committed to the Bitcoin, to cause of Bitcoin. So it, it it doesn't really matter how many people are uh, on our side. Uh, what matters is the level. Level of commitment that they have, and um, you know the ideological drive. A lot of Bitcoiners that I know, um, we uh, in, in my circle, uh, we believe about um, the uh, the legacy that we're going to be leaving behind more than than the money that we're we're making today. Like it's, it's almost as if we're we're building, you know, we're building a temple with Bitcoin. We're building something that will last thousands of years. In a, in a very like selfish way, I think okay, um, you know, the work that I'm doing in Bitcoin is is how I'm going to be remembered, and that that's something that matters to me. You know, um, uh, just side note, you know, in, in Quebec uh, we think a lot about our ancestors, and you know, I think about like my uh, great grandfather, my grandfather. Um, they were builders, and they're remembered for the stuff that they built and the impact that they had. And this is kind of like what I what I want to do with Bitcoin, and um, yeah, so 2016, 2017. I also um, realized that uh, a lot of the, uh, and, and then I became very interested in people running their own nodes, people using their own keys, because the, f the fact that a bunch of VC companies and miners were almost able to fracture a Bitcoin um, because not enough people were running their own nodes got me like, I became very uh, interested in uh, preserving Bitcoin's decentralized nature through through running nodes and all that. So. Throughout the years, I became, you know, known as the guy who tells you to like hold your own keys and run your own node. Um, yeah, and that's that's the that's the basically the story of Bull Bitcoin. You know, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to build a product which is doing it correctly, 
and um, nothing nothing else matters to me. I just I just I just want the product to implement the values of Bitcoin completely as completely as possible. And the decision to to move from just the bill payment to to selling was that because people were asking for yeah. that, or because people were paying you in yeah. bills, you needed to to recycle and both have actually. liquidity. Yeah, both actually. Um, so very interesting um, observation. We we were getting a lot of Bitcoin liquidity, and we needed fiat. Yeah. Um, so you know, having uh, to pay the bills. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So having the customers uh, provide the fiat and us give us the bitcoins and not have to go through third parties was obviously one of the one of the benefits. And everybody was asking us to to buy to buy Bitcoin from us, and so bull Bitcoin was. Like operating as a full exchange from 2015 to late 2018 uh, under another brand we were called Bitcoin Outlet, um, and uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't like hidden uh, from the public. Um, it wasn't very advertised, but we had a lot of clients from word of mouth. Actually, Bull Bitcoin has almost no marketing budget. Like the entire marketing budget of Bull Bitcoin is basically me going to Bitcoin conferences. Like that's. That's that's where we do our marketing, um, and a lot of bull Bitcoin users. It's kind of like a word of mouth thing. So so people knew that on 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 our website there was there was another you know if you click a few buttons there you can see a, a buy Bitcoin page, um, and um, I I also and then I became very passionate in delivering bitcoins in the hands of people. So uh, if you're running a non custodial Bitcoin exchange, every single trade that a user is doing is also a Bitcoin transaction. Um, so that means that you're doing a lot of Bitcoin transactions, and so I became very fascinated with building uh, inf like like software infrastructure that is able to make a lot of Bitcoin payouts to to people uh, very efficiently, very quickly, and and with very low fees. So we built this open source uh, project called CipherNode. Um, CipherNode is a uh, you know, sometimes I tell people, you know, like, well, Bitcoin only exists as a way to finance the CypherNode project. You know, um, CypherNode is an open source project which has multiple developers working on it. It's um, it's paid for entirely by Bull Bitcoin. Uh, it is the the backend infrastructure of Bull Bitcoin. But long story short, um, it allows any Bitcoin company to run their own hot wallets, cold wallets, Lightning wallets, Liquid Network wallets. Uh, it also has some coin join components. It has some transaction batching components. It has Lightning LN URL components in there. Um, and um, because companies that want to do payouts to Bitcoin will usually ref use a third party service provider. Um, you know, nothing. I, I, I get why, you know, they do that because uh, it's, it's way easier to just use someone else's wallet then build your own wallet but if all the bitcoin companies are using two or three service providers whether that's prime trust for example or bitgo um or you know i like river but you know river yeah. river is a good example of that um a lot of people well, we've seen just the danger of that yeah, this last couple yeah, of years yeah um not only is the lightning network going to be more uh, centralized because these are the main nodes in the network. Um, if one of these companies fails, then all the underlying company below is going to fail, and you can have a kind of like domino effect um, because all of these these small, you know, these very large uh, enterprise uh, Bitcoin custodial wallets for businesses are all kind of like you know sharing liquidity with each other. So if one of them fails, um, you can have a. Uh, it's just not a good thing. So, so we decided to build a, a software project that allows uh, people to replace BitGo, Prime Trust, and those kinds of things with their own setup. That's uh, that's our, our our pride and joy. Um, and yeah, so it, you guys are 100 non custodial. Like you don't yeah. custody funds for anybody. If no, somebody we don't, buys, yeah. they have to supply their Bitcoin address. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Um, that is a, an extremely niche business model. Uh, okay. So we're Bitcoin only and we're non custodial. So um, and and are most of the buys now done with Lightning or is it still so most on chain? Mo so mo most of the buys are done on chain. Um, but you guys support Lightning? We do support okay. Lightning. Um, actually, we integrated Lightning in uh, whew, late 2018. Uh, we so first, were you the first exchange that integrated well, Lightning? Well, we, it never actually worked. So, okay. so we, did, we, we, we did integrate. Uh, I, like the, the whole idea of CypherNode itself started with Lightning. So um, I wanted Bull Bitcoin and Bills to be the first business in the world to implement Lightning. Um, it was really important to me that we lead the way in there because I saw that as we, we need to, we need to demonstrate, I've, I've just been promoting the idea of layered scaling, um, same with the liquid network also. Um, so we need to implement it to show the people that it's going to work. And we implemented Lightning in late 2018, 
or yeah, early in 2019, I'm not sure, ar around that winter. And turns out that it didn't work well at all. So there was a lot of issues. Like if someone wants to buy Bitcoin, they have to invoice you. That's the first thing, right? So they have to create an invoice and send it to you. And the invoice has to be the exact right amount that you want to send them. But I'm the exchange. I'm the one who's supposed to be invoicing the client, yeah. not the other way around. So the price and moves. The, the, fraction, the price yeah. moves. This creates all sorts of issues. And then the the end users did not have inbound liquidity. So we were making payments to them. And those payments were failing like, you know, eight times out of 10. And uh, the only other possible route was to tell people, well, you know what, just use your own custodial wallet. And I really did not want to have on my website that you're supposed to use a custodial wallet. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I, but that I, was the most work those were the most likely to go through. Yeah, 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 yeah ab absolutely. And um, it just it just was a lot of work for not uh, not a lot of uh, and we're a self funded company. Also, yeah. we don't have uh, we don't have VC backers. Um, so uh, their financing comes from our, our trade revenue from the clients. So we don't we don't have a very large uh, budget to experiment on, at least at the time. And that was different because, you know, We've been holding Bitcoin <laughs> this whole year, so. Um, but uh, yeah, so we kind of like abandoned Lightning a little bit in in 2019. I was also uh, in 2019. I think there was the Lightning Torch event where um, Bitcoiners on Twitter were were playing this kind of like game where we would send each other payments online. And uh, uh, a very notable part of my uh, journey in Bitcoin was. Uh, Long story short, I'm supposed to receive a Bitcoin payment um, from some other person on Twitter, and I'm not I'm not set up. So I'm like, okay, shit. Um, I, I really want to receive this payment. So I, I spin up this node. Um, you know, I have this node running, and I'm I'm trying to get the payment running. It doesn't work. I'm trying to get inbound liquidity. Uh, I'm contacting people on Twitter. Hey, do you want to open a channel with me? Yes, no. Uh, it's taking forever, and I'm just not able to participate in the Lightning Network torch. And everybody's telling me just just download Water Satoshi, like download this thing. And I realized that everybody was using a custodial wallet, and I'm like. I was shocked. I was like, "This is this is a scam. Like, uh, Lightning doesn't actually work in an alcosodal way." So I, I got a little bit disappointed with Lightning there. Um, but what 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 I was hoping would happen actually happened is that um, builders tackled these problems and tried to solve them. I, theoretically, I was like, "I am not the only person that's that sees that the Lightning user experience, liquidity, all of that is fucking awful." Sorry for swearing, but it's just really bad, and um, uh, people ended up building products, tools, software kits to solve these problems. Um, one of them, for example, was LNURL, which everybody uses today under the you know name of Lightning address. Um, but the invention of LNURL um, withdraw, which is like you can receive Bitcoin by scanning a QR code. Uh, that experience of I want to receive Bitcoin and I'm, because normally you scan a QR code and you send money, but I can create a QR code for someone and someone can scan it and receive money from me. Um, that to me was like, all right, this is the user experience that was missing for us to make this work at Bull Bitcoin. Um, so we integrated Lightning in 2021. I think probably around now it's probably more. I think it's probably around five to ten percent of of transactions that are done with Lightning. Um, but obviously, this will end up being more. I think I think we're at the turning point now where. Um, Lightning is uh, definitely part of like. There's a lot more Lightning wallets. Yeah. The Lightning wallets are better. Um, I I expect that. And the non-custodial yeah. wallets are, are much better because that was in the early yeah. days. The the custodial wallets worked decently. The yeah. non-custodial wallets were a yeah. challenge. But that I, seems like it's it's come a long way. I I I am often going back and forth between optimistic about Bitcoin and pessimistic about Bitcoin. You know, um, when I see stuff like ordinals people spamming bitcoin and uh although although you know this is the way bitcoin is supposed to work and there's a fee mechanism and that's what keeps bitcoin decentralized um a lot of people in the world world are, are suffering because of that because yeah. uh people we know, saw that here it yeah. was it was a big yeah. irritant yeah but but at the same time you know um there's been incredible and i i've been privy to development in lightning because um i'm i'm building a non-custodial lightning wallet, like I'm actually building one now. So I've been uh, discussing- Separate from bull Bitcoin or is it part uh, of the- So uh, actually at the at the Adopting Bitcoin conference, this was like my announcement quote, quote, which is that we released an on-chain non-custodial wallet um, that's gonna be integrated with the bull Bitcoin exchange. So my my idea uh, to make uh, my, my, you know, my, my company pitch the, as short as possible is that 
people don't self-custody not because they don't want to, um, but because they simply are not really aware that they can. And because part of the user experience of onboarding is into Bitcoin is that you send fiat to an exchange, you click buy, and then boom, the Bitcoin is, your, is, is in your account. And um, the user experience is not really geared towards like self, you know, the exchange wants you to buy Bitcoin. The exchange doesn't want you to withdraw the Bitcoins from the exchange. Um, they have no incentive at all. Yeah. In fact, some exchanges probably don't want you to withdraw from the exchange because if you're there, you're more likely to trade, more likely to get into shit coins. Yeah, yeah, uh, they, they might they might need you as uh, as liquidity for for other stuff that they're doing. Um, so um, I I want people to self custody almost without knowing it. Um, in in a in a user experience where self custody is just the default user experience, so um, we launched this on chain um, Bitcoin wallet, which is uh, now on the Google Play Store. It's called Bull Bitcoin, and um, it's going to be linked to the Bull Bitcoin exchange in the sense that um, when you when you buy Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is going to be sent to your non custodial wallet. So you're not going to have to install like a separate wallet and like copy and paste stuff back and forth. Um, you might not even you're not even going to see Bitcoin addresses, right? You're just going to have like money in your Canadian dollar account or Colonus account. You're going to click buy. The money will appear on your Bitcoin account on your phone, uh, but the Bitcoin account is actually uh, so a it's a non-custodial bank. account, but it mimics what people yes. are used to with yes. having a bank account or something like yeah. that. So yeah. it's kind of the yeah. the best of both worlds. And like my goal is to exactly as you said is to mimic the custodial experience. There's only one thing that you cannot abstract away, that is. The backup. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no matter how hard you work at UX and you know make your product seamless, the person still needs to back up the twelve words. Um, so, so that's. Uh, but if the only difference between custodial and non-custodial is is this is this backup, and if you create an app which um, you know approaches this in in a way where uh, the the user will successfully make his back, because it's not that hard to self custody. It really isn't. Uh, there's, you know, people. Um, I have like this bell curve meme where, you know, on one end, it's like you write down 12 words. And on the other hand, it's like you need to have, you know, multi-sig with hardware wallets, redundant backups and all, all sorts of things. But re realistically, um, having uh, 12 words written down on a piece of paper that's in your house and maybe another backup of that piece of paper, like at your parents' place or something like that, um, is orders of magnitude more safe than having Bitcoins on an exchange. The number one way that people lose Bitcoins by far, and that's not even close, is they get rugged by exchanges. Um, it's it, wallets. It's not that wallets get hacked. Uh, it's not that there's double spans or uh, other things related to the Bitcoin network. Um, it's it's exchanges will will uh, lose or steal their Bitcoins. So, so I'm curious because and and I. I don't have uh, I don't feel like I understand it well enough to know mm. what the truth is, but a lot of people would argue the opposite that more people lose their Bitcoin because they screw up their self, you know, they lose their their keywords or so what would you say to those people? Do you think I, that, I, that I, maybe that was in the mm -hmm. past but not now or what or I, definitely lo losing the backup is I think probably the third Way that the, the first one is definitely if you, if you just look at the absolute amounts like how many bitcoins have been hacked or lost in exchanges, mm, it's got it's got to be in the millions at this point, right? You know, just Mt. Gox was six hundred and fifty thousand yeah. bitcoins. Uh, you know, it's it's just crazy. Um, p people losing their their backup and passphrase is definitely. Um, the second way is people just get scammed into investing in Ponzi. That's very, very common. Um, they get scammed into investing in like cloud mining scams or, or shit coins or stuff like that. Um, losing, losing your. Or passwords. what we've seen here yeah. is they they think they have a boyfriend or girlfriend yeah. somewhere. That, yeah, you know, yeah, had yeah. a medical emergency. Yeah, and, yeah. And but you know, the the passphrase is the only thing that you can control as the end user, right? So um, you cannot control whether or not your custodian is going to rug you. Yeah. Uh, you can control how you uh, manage your your passwords and your backup. Um, and uh, also people's exchange accounts get hacked all the time. So well, I had uh, uh, my wallet of Satoshi yeah. account. And I, it, I hardly use it. I didn't yeah. have much funds yeah. in it, but they hacked into my email and then they were able to, you yeah. know, from that. Yeah, so recover. that was eye-opening to me. That yeah. Like, I mean, I know, you know, I never, yeah. never keep more than, you know, you would yeah. keep in your physical wallet and yes. anything like that. But but it was crazy how fast it happened. Yeah. And, and yeah. And, and it's also because... Uh, people are not used to having irrecoverable loss, 
right? Because there's always someone you can complain yeah. to when you're using a you know the banking system or third party. You can, you 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 can scream long enough at someone over the phone and get your money back normally. With Bitcoin, you know you can scream into the void forever, and uh, it, the the Bitcoin gods will will never grant you your wishes. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely that. Um, that aspect where people sadly don't value their own money, um, but usually, it's, it's uh, if you lose your bitcoins once, you probably will not lose it twice. Yeah. Also. No, for me, I I, <laughs> I look at that as as a gift that yeah. I lost. I don't know yeah. what it was, you know, yeah, hundred thousand sats or something yeah. that I had in that account. But it was like, wow, that was a good lesson to learn to, to not keep anything and. I, I did. I did change my mind a little bit about self custody. I used to be like a, a self custody fundamentalist and absolutist, and everyone else that you know, every anybody that is promoting custody in any way, shape, or form is like my enemy, and I must defeat them. Uh, I, I've 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 definitely changed my mind a little bit uh, on that. Um, I want. Uh, to create something which uh, which is kind of like a standard, so I want to create a, a product which is it's like the most extreme version of Bitcoin, right? It's like no, it's, it's self custody is is mandatory. Yeah. Uh, with my product, I, I do understand that there is a there is a, a path um, from first starting out with custody and then eventually moving on to self custody. Personally, one of the reasons why um, I don't want to uh, custody Bitcoins is because I could not myself as an individual sleep knowing that I'm holding other people's yeah. Bitcoins. And it's a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility. It's a lot of stress. I, I want to reduce my, Bitcoin is already stressful as it is. I want to reduce my personal stress as much as possible. One of the things that that um, I think about all the time is, let's say that I'm a custodian and uh, I'm in good faith. I got good security. Um, what happens if like people die? I have their Bitcoins. What happened if they, they just disappear? I'm going to... Uh, and and the, the bitcoins don't move forever. What happens if I want to close my business? What yeah. happens if I want to retire? How do I send? The, what do I do with those bitcoins? You know, I'm. It's it's almost as if I'm inevitably going to, even though I don't want to, like take people's bitcoins. Well, we saw know? that recently with was a blue wallet. I think when they got yeah, rid of their that custodial is, lightning product. They, that that is exactly what I'm like, talking hey, about. They were like, hey, take your bitcoin, take yeah, your bitcoin. And, and, and there's pe people that you people know. people were, weren't, weren't responding. Yeah. Um, but I, I do believe that we're going to find a way. Um, I, I think it's important for custodial wallets to find a path towards towards like getting people to to self custody. Um, which also brings me to our maybe our next topic, which is Bitcoin jungle. Yes, um, yes. So, so I want to I, I want to understand though too how you wound up in Costa Rica, where yeah. Bitcoin jungle is, because yeah. you were obviously you're Canadian. Yeah. Your your business is in Canada, yeah. and then all of a sudden, I think when I first connected yeah. with you, you were in Costa Rica, and I, yes. I never quite understood how that jump happened, and if it was COVID related or what the yeah it's path a, was. It's a very common story. You'll hear the story a lot if you're in Central America or Mexico, which is that uh, I was I was in Canada during the uh, the lockdown, and uh, I uh, uh, had difficulty handling the lockdown. I I am a I consider myself to be a, a sovereign individual, you know, hacker mindset, freedom oriented, and uh, the uh, the idea that um, the government can lock me in my house and force me to you know get vax or wear a mask uh, wasn't just not sitting with me at all and so so explain to me a little bit as an american yeah. and and there's a number yeah. of canadians that live here in el zante mm -hmm. and i was appalled at what was happening in the u.s but then i would talk to canadians yeah. and they're like oh if i go home i have to isolate for two weeks i'm like yeah but do you really they're like oh no my neighbors will report me if i i, I think don't. I, so yeah the, the, the difference i was surprised at how like crazy canada was yeah that time. and uh the, the the culture is the there was there was massive massive cultural cultural pressure where um there there we don't we don't have that culture of constitutional right and individual freedom and individual liberty it's a very collectivist type of society um so that's ultimately why i left it's because you know um i saw my childhood friends turn on me very quickly I saw like because you weren't masking and isolating and know, vaccinating, I, you were, and, you and were at, an enemy or what was the what do you mean, I, turn on you at, at the time? It wasn't even masking because there was no mask. Actually, it was just because I was leaving my house and I wanted to meet up in person. I wanted to go to the park. That's like one of the first things that happened is uh, I suggested we go to the park and hang out instead of hanging out on Zoom. That led to a discussion where I was I was 
um, you know, accused of uh, not caring about people's grandmothers' lives, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, do you think those people have come around to realize uh, yeah. how crazy that was? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They, they they have, but you know, um, I think it, I think uh, it can happen again. Yeah. Um, the, the the culture was very heavy, and um, I left for Costa Rica. Um, because it was one of the only countries where you could, you know, travel and, and get into. And I, I, I had friends in Costa Rica I had been there before, and I saw that in the countryside, you know, in, in the kind of like more remote areas, um, people were were in the same page. There's there's a big community of expatriates, expats, um, living in Costa Rica that uh, that live there because they want to be off the grid. They want to live in a kind of like more communal setting outside of the system. There's there's also a kind of a cultural anti big pharma culture amongst you know central and south american expats um so it just seemed like a like a like a good place to be just to you know get away from all get, get away from it all and i moved down there and uh you know i i became a surfer uh, i was surfing a little bit before but i became um very passionate about surfing and um it's just uh it's just it's it's just a, a good wholesome healthy life down there um i didn't see myself uh, living in a big city, living in a pod, um, eating industrial food. I, I had like uh, the awakening that a lot of people have in Bitcoin, which is that, um, okay, I, I was really focused about Bitcoin money uh, and freedom, but then I started to think a little, a lot more about um, health, medicine, um, alternative ways of living. I got into the carnivore diet also briefly, uh, you know, not, I'm not a carnivore, fully, full carnivore anymore, but you know, I went down the rabbit hole in, uh, and I, I credit Bitcoin for this specifically because it's other Bitcoiners that were, were discussing these other topics that I became, uh, and the, 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 the overall theme was, you know, um, value, you know, value your money, value your time, value your health, um, and be, be skeptical of the establishment. And um, when I when I moved to Costa Rica, uh, one of the reasons why I stayed is actually there was a lot of Bitcoiners down there. There was a there was a big community of Bitcoiners down there. We started a Bitcoin meetup in, in Costa Rica, um, and uh, you know we uh, uh, a lot of Canadians that that were Bitcoiners just all, we all spontaneously moved to to Costa Rica. So we started a Bitcoin meetup. That's how I met a lot of the Bitcoiners that are even here at the conference. You know, Paul, um, for example, the uh, the you know. F famous Bitcoin surfer, um, uh, we, we met down there and started to get involved in, in some local projects. Um, and then eventually I moved just randomly to this, uh, this area of Costa Rica, which is called Bahia, ba Bahia ba Ballena. So it's, a, it's an area of Costa Rica, the towns of Dominical, Patanillo, Ojochal, Uvita. And uh, I knew that there was some, something down there called Bitcoin Beach. I had no idea what it was. I didn't move there for Bitcoin at all. I moved there. Just because it's a, it's just a nice, you know, wholesome family oriented. Yeah. Was it Bitcoin Beach or Bitcoin Jungle? Oh, sorry, Bitcoin Jungle. I said Bitcoin Beach. You're right. Um, yeah. So it's, an, it's a, so the Bitcoin project, uh, Bitcoin Jungle project was down there, and again, um, my initial reaction to them was extreme skepticism and suspicious, yeah. right? Because I'm like, okay, custodial wallet. Yeah. So who are these people? Yeah. They're custodial wallet. They're getting all the merchants to basically send the uh, holding holding bitcoins on behalf of all these people. Um, what's their, um, you know, are they shit corners? Are they scammers? Like, I have no idea who they are. And I showed up to a meetup uh, organized by Bitcoin Jungle. And uh, it was hilarious. It was so fun. The first, the first meetup, um, obviously they knew who I was. I'm not like fully incognito, but I'm not like, you know, I, I didn't announce that I was coming or anything. I just showed up there. And then these guys were full-blown Bitcoin maximalists, um, definitely sharing the same values as me. Uh, I was, uh, everything that they were saying was just music to my ears and, um, I became friends with them personally. And, um, I, uh, and, you know, we, we, we discussed a lot about, you know, custody, self-custody, um, why they ended up, um, doing, a, uh, it, it has a lot to do with the, the onboarding experience where we are trying to, to have a, a perfectly safe and easy onboarding experience for people who know nothing about Bitcoin. And just to demonstrate the power, there, there's, there's aspects of Bitcoin which are like censorship resistance and sovereignty. There's other aspects that are much more simple, which is like you don't need paperwork to open an account, yeah. right? So that's just like huge difference um, from the tradition and something that Bitcoiners don't often think about where like you can download an app and receive money without applying and getting approved. 
uh, that's that's a huge deal for a lot of people who don't have paperwork or who don't have a physical address or who um, don't speak Which English. Which in a lot of places you don't yeah. have. I mean, even here in, yeah. in El Zante at the beach, the, like, you don't have addresses. Yeah, so yeah there's that, no address. You so know. if you're trying to deal with the bank, they don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Like, well, what do you mean you don't have an address? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and I, uh, I'm not going to endorse <laughs> custodial wallets. Uh, however, I do understand that uh, uh, it's... There, there is a way that you can do it, and that also has to do with um, you know there's there's a trust component. So in at the community level, um, the Bitcoin Jungle guys, um, the the founders of Bitcoin Jungle. I mean, I I kind of like retroactively consider myself. I'm not a founder, but I'm I'm part of the team. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a very uh, flat organization in the sense that there there is no such thing as like the Bitcoin Jungle Corp corporation. Uh, I mean, there there is one because we're publishing an app on the App Store, and like you need like a, a corporation yeah, to yeah. do that. But apart apart from from that technicality, like there is there is no one in charge. Like, I mean, that's basically a Bitcoin beach is too. Yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. grassroots. There's yeah. no official like it, it's it's very grassroots. So you know, it's it's pretty much uh, the organization is pretty much a WhatsApp group of of people who are um, trying to contribute in any way they can, and uh, it it ended up being uh, yes. Yeah, so, so so these guys. In 2021, early 2021, um, based off of uh, Bitcoin Jungle, it's it's so not only is it based off, sorry based off Bitcoin Beach, so um, based off the Bitcoin Beach project, but also based off of the Galoi software yeah. stack, which powers the Bitcoin Beach wallet. Uh, that's the beautiful open source software. So so the Bitcoin Beach wallet was open source. So well, I remember Nicholas telling me he's yeah. like. Hey, somebody's forked this in Costa Rica. So awesome. Mm -hmm. We don't even know who they are. Yep. But you know, at that yep. time they had not even talked, but they had forked the wallet. Yeah. Uh, and they so, were super excited about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, so the 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 wizard of Bitcoin Jungle is a guy called Lee. Um, Lee, Lee is a software engineer and uh, he forked uh, Bitcoin Beach. Just bas basically just added Colonus instead of dollars and, you know, a few little minor modifications. And then they started to run this. Um, we also run a bunch of BTC pay servers and they started to convince uh, local merchants to accept Bitcoin. Um, the thing that that helped us down there is because some of the founding members of the Bitcoin Jungle project are are like well-known members of the local community, well-respected people. So they leverage kind of like their, their personal network in mm -hmm. Like, you know, trust me, accept yeah. Bitcoin, right? Just, just trust me, accept Bitcoin. It's just, it's just, there's nothing bad about it. It's just going to be good, positive stuff, positive vibes. Um, and I started out with, um, you know, with a few restaurants and a few, and a few shops. And then something amazing happened, which is that the, the farmer's market in Dominical and in uh, Uvita, uh, were, were convinced to promote Bitcoin to their vendors. And then we did a lot of work to get the, the vendors to accept Bitcoin. And there was like a, a snowball effect where, you know, if you have a if you have a farmer's market where let's say there's like I don't know like uh, 50 vendors, which is pretty much the size of the Dominican farmers market, and let's say you have 10 of them who are accepting Bitcoin, you start to have Bitcoin tourism mm -hmm. that comes a little bit, and then you know the other people that are accepting Bitcoin, they're being asked by everyone like, so you accept Bitcoin? No, why not? Like why you know? And then uh, and then they see those customers going to the people. That yeah, are accepting. yeah. And and uh, after a little while, um, you know, I think about uh, right now probably, I would say two thirds two thirds of the vendors um, of the Dominical and Uvita farmers markets accept Bitcoin. So it created this like buzz, and um, nobody had bad experiences with Bitcoin. And you needed a few pioneers to like take that risk. And you know, some people are on the sidelines waiting to see what happens. And like nothing bad happens; only good things happen. Um, I think you had Lee and some others kind of. Pro Providing liquidity for those that needed yeah, to cash out yeah, to be able to support, pay their, yeah. their suppliers. So, so this this obviously is not happening by itself, right? So uh, an incredible amount of of time in explaining Bitcoin, installing wallets, uh, doing customer support. It's it's it, it's not magical to to do a, a a local Bitcoin community. It really just takes a lot of time and dedication. And um, those those vendors needed a way to cash out. Um, although surprisingly, a lot of Bitcoin jungle vendors hold Bitcoin. Um, I don't have the stats in my head, but um, I, I, I would say like I don't I don't want to make up a stat actually. Yeah. But but uh, well, uh, you uh, see a uh, lot of times yeah. that initially they want to yeah. cash out, but then over time yeah. they start thinking, 
Why am I holding in this yeah. currency that's going down over time? So, some some vendors also started to buy Bitcoin, which was awesome during the during the like bear market during the summer. They were like, "Wait a minute! I was accepting Bitcoin payments when it was forty thousand. Now it's sixteen thousand. I should probably buy some now." You know, um, and uh, uh, yeah, we were physically cashing people out. It was mostly Lee, the human Bitcoin ATM. Um, so none of this could have happened without Lee. He really. Um, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Like, you know, Bitcoin Jungle doesn't have an official leader, but Lee is definitely, you know, uh, the uh, the the driving force of the project. And he's just spent, I mean, none of us are paid. None of us are making money off of this, right? It's it's a fully, we don't charge fees or anything. Um, we're definitely losing money <laughs> on, on Bitcoin Jungle. Like, so um, don't accuse us of like, you know, using this to, to make money from, from, from local Costa Ricans. We are definitely losing money on this um, and time and energy, but it's, it's not lost, obviously. Yeah. It's, it's invested in the community. That's the best way to put it. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, at some point, um, just, just, just kind of took off. And, I, and right now we're like at, uh, I don't know, 200, 200 something, 250 merchants in Costa Rica. And it started to grow beyond the Bitcoin jungle area where, uh, and, 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 it, and it became kind of a meme. There's there's a tourism marketing effect also where um, it's the same thing that happened with El Zante, right? It's like um, Bitcoiners want to travel to places where you can spend Bitcoin. Yeah. And that just brings business there. Um, so we've had, um, you know, great feedback from the community. Um, I think that one of the major differences between there's, there's a bunch of differences. Uh, Costa Rica is generally a fairly well banked country. So, um, it is annoying to open a bank account and banking in Costa Rica is frustrating and annoying, but, um, it's it's not like an it's not like a very unbanked place. It's it's decent. It's much more developed than El Salvador. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so so banking is not exactly like a huge challenge. Like no nobody's prevented from getting a bank account. Uh, the other the other difference um, with Bitcoin adoption is we kind of targeted uh, in, in, instead of trying to to get like to get Bitcoin widely adopted amongst Costa Ricans, um, we were just trying to get a way uh, for foreigners to spend their Bitcoins. Um, so most of the early merchants that we were targeting were merchants that were selling goods and services to to gringos essentially, yeah. right, to, to foreigners. Um, so so that's kind of like how we kickstarted it is like, we cannot have merchant adoption if we don't have people spending, right? So who is likely to spend Bitcoin? It's it's the it's the foreigners. Um, so so we started to target like the business because it solves a problem for them. Oh, even yeah. if they're not a Bitcoiner, it's if there's an easy way to not have to deal with the banking system uh, and be able to live. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, there's 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 a lot of problems in in you know living in Central America that you might not think about. Like there's just no uh, there's just no ATMs. <laughs> so uh, it's and the ATMs just are often empty of yeah, cash. Yeah, uh, that is so the most frustrating. You go and then yeah, it's like yeah. So no money so in get, it. getting cash is is hard. Getting money into Costa Rica is quite difficult. Um, there is a, a local currency called the Colones. So if you're getting money to the country, you have to convert to Colones. Usually also, if you have a credit card, they're converting to Colones locally, you're paying outrageous fees. So on top of the like two something percent credit card fee, two to 3% credit card fee, you have like another two or 3% currency conversion fee. Um, if you're withdrawing like cash from a credit card at an ATM in Costa Rica, you know, you're with around 200 bucks, your fees are going to be like, you know, 20 bucks, you know, it's going to be like 10%, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very expensive. Um, it's also, uh, if you're getting a, a, tr a bank transfer into Costa Rica, um, you're probably going to have to go in person to the bank to explain where the money's coming from and fill in some forms. It's, it's just very inconvenient. Um, so we solved the, we solved the problem for the, the expats first and foremost, and the locals, uh, that are, that are serving these expats, um, they're they're like acquiring Bitcoin, you know, price fluctuated. Also, so it, have you seen a lot of foreigners that weren't necessarily Bitcoiners, but they're now using Bitcoin just because it's easier? Um, that's definitely coming be becoming a thing. So, so the idea of being able to bring Bitcoin into the uh, money into the country with Bitcoin is is starting to enter the the the, the mindset of of foreigners, and also, um, yeah, now you know the the adoption uh, is now a lot also with with locals. So locals are are there is a circular economy which is, is 
the, the, the loop is slowly closing. I think it's going to take a lot, a, a lot of time, but we definitely have like multiple anecdotes of merchants receiving a Bitcoin payment, paying other merchants with Bitcoin, paying staff with Bitcoin. Um, we have a feature also on our point of sale system where um, you can, you can sp split the, the tips uh, of your bill to different um, people's Bitcoin Lightning network addresses. Um, so there, there's definitely a circular economy that's, that's, that's starting. Um, I don't know if you saw the, yeah. the announcement that Galloway made yeah. at the adopting Bitcoin that they got, I think it was like the second biggest yeah. wholesale supplier yeah. in El Salvador is, yeah. is, and Guatemala also, I think, yeah. is now accepting Bitcoin payments yeah. from all these little stores and they're actually offering them a 5% discount if they pay in Bitcoin. Makes total it sense. solves a big issue for yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it makes total sense. And actually what's funny is, uh, uh, speaking of which, so one of the things that, that we did, okay, so... Going back to Bitcoin Jungle and like what I contribute there, I mean, my I have I have all sorts of Bitcoin related skills, but my main you know shtick is Bitcoin exchanging. Right, that's that's my specialization, I guess. Um, so what I was interested in is solving the problem of merchants cashing out, and that's kind of ironic because I don't want people to cash Bitcoin out. I want people to hold their Bitcoin. I mean, my my dream is that bull Bitcoin becomes obsolete. Uh, when the the day the day that bull Bitcoin is obsolete is the day that I've succeeded. Um, I, I don't want to run a Bitcoin exchange forever. I want fiat. I want fiat to disappear. That's like yeah. my mission. However, um, if you accept Bitcoin, if you cannot cash your Bitcoin out, you're unlikely to to accept Bitcoin payments. Um, you, it sounds also like a scam, you know, if, if you're, if you're just, you've never heard about Bitcoin, you know, it's like, yeah, you can accept Bitcoin, but like, you can't get rid of it. You can't sell it for dollars. <laughs> you just have to keep it. And it's like, uh, I don't know. Like, what if I want to quit this thing? It's like, no, you can't quit. You know, you must stay with Bitcoin and Bitcoin forever. Um, and uh, I also wanted to help Lee out because Lee was driving around the Costa Rican countryside with cash, <laughs> giving cash to merchants. It is not a safe thing to do. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a, taking a lot of personal risks to do that. So um, I ended up um, trying to figure out how to uh, how to connect Bitcoin to the local banking system. And after a long time of trying to figure it out, we did actually succeed, it, uh, succeed at this. So Costa Rica has, and that's a, that's a huge difference between Costa Rica and El Salvador, which I think definitely this, this, this needs, something like this needs to happen in El Salvador, which is Costa Rica has a, a mobile fiat payment system, which is called SINPAY. Uh, which is run by the Central Bank of Costa Rica, um, but which allows people to pay each other uh, essentially with their phone numbers, with by, by texting fiat to each other. Um, so what we figured out is how to connect uh, Bitcoin to this uh, fiat payment uh, system so that, uh, which everybody uses, like yeah. you're in the middle of the, the Costa Rican countryside, really there's a guy on the side of the road with coconuts he will accept SINPAY payments because- We saw that in Brazil with yeah, the PIX system with PIX. that they have. Ve very very similar. similar. And PIX is also, I think, a central bank of Brazil yeah. project. Um, so, oof, am I, <laughs> am I, am I going to praise the work of central banks here? Like, yikes, okay, I'm walking on eggshells. No, but it, it, is, it, is a great, it, it is a great payment system. It works. It, wor it, it works. It, it works really well. Um, so what, what I figured out, like my magic is basically to connect um, Bitcoin payments to this uh, payment rails where, now, what you can do uh, in Costa Rica is straight from the Bitcoin Jungle wallet. And, you know, I'll give credit to Lee built this thing and I um, built the financial kind of infrastructure in the back end. Lee coded it inside the Bitcoin Jungle app. Um, uh, you can convert a Lightning payment to an SMS fiat payment uh, really instantly. And uh, I, I, I will say... Uh, with no humility whatsoever, that it is the coolest Bitcoin experience on the planet. Uh, it is the coolest Bitcoin off ramp that I've ever seen, the one that I've built. Obviously, I'm biased, but uh, I'm actually, no, it's actually amazing. So um, the SingPay payment happens instantly, um, and the recipient uh, just sees a text message coming on his phone. So you're in the side of the highway, guy sells coconuts, he has a sign on his stand, which is his phone number. You type in the phone number, you click send from your, Bitcoin, from your Lightning wallet. Instantly, he gets a text message. I mean, it's using an API system, so it's like really instant. So that's that's really cool. Also, it allows people in Costa Rica to buy Bitcoin with this. Uh, so they basically text our phone number, uh -huh. and uh, we see it automatically. We send a Lightning payment to their wallet. So you send a text message, and then you receive Bitcoin on your wallet. So it's it's a very very cool experience, and that has taken the Bitcoin Jungle project a little bit to the next step, where now. 
for example, um, we have like hardware stores that didn't want to accept Bitcoin that are like, oh, you can convert to SingPay. Okay, great. Now I'll take I'll take Bitcoin yeah. for sure, you know. Um, Which makes more people want to accept it because they yeah. know if they can spend it anywhere, they're more likely yes. to want to accept it. So I, because I, I have this argument with people all the time, not argument, but I, because yeah. I understand where they're coming from, but no, we don't want people to convert out. And even with what you guys are doing, yeah. technically they're selling their Bitcoin. And so yeah. that's not the end goal. We want it to yeah. circulate. But the more on and off ramps there are, the more likely people will leave the fiat system altogether. The best way to convince someone to hold Bitcoin is to let them sell Bitcoin and regret it. Yeah, definitely. All the merchants that sold Bitcoin in the last three months regret it. I think they're they're more likely to, okay, start thinking about why is the price of Bitcoin going up? Like what happened? You know, yeah. what happened to Bitcoin? Well, you know, the first thing you gotta learn about Bitcoin is that there's only 21 million. Oh, really? And so well, it's, they're talking yeah. to their friends that are like, yeah. oh, maybe not even, they weren't even thinking about yeah. it, not even doing it purposely, but they're like, oh, yeah. I didn't sell my Bitcoin and now it's worth twice yeah. as much. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, unfortunately we need to interface with the, that's, that's the worst part about running a Bitcoin exchange. It's a, terrible line of business it's it's horrible to run a bitcoin exchange because like as a bitcoin exchange you your job is to touch fiat you're yeah. basically you're you, you know you, you're you're receiving and sending fiat payments that's what that's what you do uh, the bitcoin part of running a bitcoin exchange is fantastic it's like you know i receive and send bitcoin payments that's there's never any problems with that i guarantee you one thing that really makes me s i receive and send fiat payments like thousands per day in different countries and i receive and send bitcoin payments there's never issues with Bitcoin. Like the only issues with Bitcoin that I see are like the current issue of today, uh, November 9th, 2023, is that the fees are super high and that's causing, uh, it's super expensive to operate a non custodial exchange and it's causing congestion. So apart from the fee dynamics, which is Bitcoin's uh, Achilles heel, downside, uh, you know, source of issues. Apart from that, um, Bitcoin transactions always confirm and Bitcoin transactions that I received are never canceled or charged back, which obviously does not happen with fiat. Uh, one of the reasons that there's K there's so much KYC and permissioned uh, access to the financial and payment system is because most bank transactions, most fiat transactions of any kind are reversible. Um, if you, again, if you yell loud enough at your bank, they will reverse a payment. And uh, how do you prevent um, payments from being reversed? Is well, you KYC and you identify everybody um, so that there can be no frivolous reversing a, of payments. Um, so KYC is a, is a government regulatory thing, but it's also a fraud prevention thing. Yeah. Um, with Bitcoin, I can accept a Bitcoin payment from anybody anywhere on the planet. You know, uh, if I'm receiving a fiat payment, I want to make sure that whoever is sending me the payment is the legitimate owner of a bank account. So I need to like KYC him and I, I need to KYC the person. And I also need to like check his bank account to make sure that these things, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. With Bitcoin, you know, um, I see the confirmation on the blockchain. You're good, man. Like whatever. Uh, with Lightning, it's like as soon as the payment is done, uh, uh, it's, it's a fully settled payment. Um, people like people don't appreciate like the settlement value of Bitcoin until they run like a, you know, a, a, until they're a merchant and they accept credit card payments and they see that a lot of them are getting canceled and charged back for fraud. Well, I mean, I have a food business in the U.S. and yeah. we take credit cards. It's and it's become. It's crazy. It's be, you know, before COVID, I think it was 40%. Now it's like 60 plus percent. And, yeah. but you get, you'll just get these random chargebacks. And, yeah. and, you know, a lot of times people forget that they bought it. Most of them is not even like fraud. They forgot that they spent or they, yeah. you know, it was, or some of them do it purposely because yeah, they yeah. know that, that if they dispute it, they don't have to pay it. And yeah. it's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Such a pain in the butt. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So, uh, coming back to Bitcoin generally now, yeah, we, we are, Kind of a getting into a zone where people are using the Bitcoin Jungle app all over the country. It's no longer it's no longer in the Bitcoin Jungle like Baya Ballena, Yuvita area. Um, it's exciting. It's a little frightening at the same time because it started out, you know, we just wanted to help local merchants, and now it's 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 growing on its own. And it's kind of like an, at this point, it's kind of like okay, it's 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 happening. You know, it's unstoppable. We're we're scaling this thing. Um, it's, it, but it, it is, it is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, you know, uh, it's a lot of fun when we, are you worried about things on the governmental level that they're going to try to stop this or do you feel <laughs> like it's, 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very worried. Uh, Bitcoin in Costa Rica is, is in a, an interesting, an interesting place where there's no, there's no legal framework for Bitcoin. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, like Bitcoin does not exist in, in, in legislation or regulation. Um, it's like selling corn or something like that. Like, it's I mean, that's a, my, that's my personal interpretation. Yeah. You know, you know, my personal interpretation is, uh, the, the central bank of there, the only thing that's ever come out of the government is the central bank of Costa Rica saying that it is not a currency and, uh, you should be very careful yeah. about it. You know, it's bad, something like that, you know, so Use it's at like, your own risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's not a currency. Okay. Um, so if it's not a currency, what else could it be? It could be a security, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, there's no like interpretation yeah. at all saying it's, just, it's a security. So if it's not a currency, it's not a security. Well, it's a commodity, you know, or it's just nothing, whatever it is. It's, uh, so, so, so Bitcoin is not regulated at the moment. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a far west. So same thing that happened in Canada, basically. So it, my experience in Canada was that the, the Bitcoin regulations in Canada only really happened in 2020. So between 2013 and 2020, it was kind of like the far west in Canada where, you know, however, um, we do kind of like preemptively limit uh, behaviors that are obviously sketchy and stuff like that, because even though technically uh, you might not be regulated in the country, you still don't want to be, you know, you, 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 you don't, you don't want to be targeting like. You want to help facilitate some yeah, scam or yeah, something like that. And, and, and it's, uh, yeah. And especially, you know, in, in the context of the context of Latin America and drug traffic and all sorts of human traffic potential stuff. I mean, there's, there's just out of like our personal morality, yeah, like we, yeah. I, I don't want to help you know, drug importers and, and, you know, child traffickers, obviously. So, uh, but you know, they don't use Bitcoin, honestly. So yeah. they use, they use, yeah, they all yeah. use us dollars. So, so I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worried about those people using the Bitcoin jungle at all. Um, and I, I also don't want people to like spam us. So we, we have imposed ourselves like some reasonable limits. For example, in the Bitcoin jungle app, you can only, you can only do like a thousand dollar Canadian per day of transactions. And, and if you, if you want to do more transactions, um, we're gonna we're gonna ask for your KYC, right? So it, it, let's say that you you want to buy like uh, thirty thousand dollars. We had a client, you know, they, they, he wanted to buy thirty thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin for his business. Um, I'm not just gonna no KYC, yeah, unregulated. Yeah. Like let him do that. I'm gonna be like, yo, okay, like you know, who are you? What's your name? What's your business? Uh, can you send me a photo of your ID? Um, so we are like self regulating a little bit, but also also um, also allowing um, you know. Uh, a lot of flexibility to for for smaller transactions. Um, there's definitely a lot of people that want Bitcoin to be regulated in Costa Rica. There's talks going on. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not Costa Rican. Um, I don't presume to get involved in, in in politics. I don't want to meddle in politics at all here. Uh, thankfully, the Bitcoin Jungle family or community of supporters. Um, there are a lot of Ticos uh, that are, um, you know, living in the capital city uh, that are s extremely supportive of our, of our efforts because obviously they, um, you know, uh, Costa Rican Bitcoiners, like, you know, we have the, f I, I, if I, if I may say, I, I think we have the full support of the, of the local Costa Rican Bitcoin community, even though we are like kind of like expats and yeah, foreigners, you yeah. know, we're not Costa Ricans, but um, results, results speak for themselves. Like we've, we've created something pretty, pretty cool down there. Um, so and there was no Costa Rican exchange before, correct? There, there, there really wasn't. Costa Rica, unfortunately, is also a very shit coiner country. Uh, there is a lot of shit coiners down there. A lot, a lot of scams there. Um, it's uh, you know Max and Stacy, I think, in El Salvador, and and you guys and. Uh, you guys at um, Bitcoin Beach and you know me Premier Bitcoin and all, all all the there's there's like you know it's a maximalist kind of country you especially know? Max and Stacy I gave yeah. a shout out to them because yeah they, that's not an easy job they're yeah. like yeah. it's like whack a mole they like yeah. pop up and and specifically Stacy yeah they, she they does, did a, uh, she, she's the guard she dog she does not let them hide out <laughs> yeah um, so uh, Costa Rica is not like that there's definitely a lot of a lot of shit coins and stuff like that um, but you know. Our project in Bitcoin Jungle is obviously, you know, maximalist. Um, so right now, the uh, there's there's a bunch of Bitcoin maximalists that are um, 
they're, they're, the, the idea so is... So I'm just curious, where, yeah. where do most people buy all oh, their yeah. shit points? Um, like through uh, Binance? Or yeah, yeah. The... So there's no, there's, there was no local Costa Rican exchange. There was no local, there was no exchange that was connected to the, the Synpay system. So, I'll, so we are the first like crypto Bitcoin exchange to um, tap into this rails. Um, yeah, most people use Binance. Yeah. So most, most people, their, their entire Bitcoin or crypto experience is having a Binance account. Yeah. Right. Which is awful, uh, an awful experience. Um, it's also, you know, but now you provide, I mean, it's just yeah. an easier experience. They can buy yeah. right through the sim pay Bitcoin only. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's a, it's a lightning first experience also, which is phenomenal because, um, the vast, uh, with, with, uh, Bitcoin jungle and build Bitcoin, you cannot use on chain on chain is not an option. So when you're buying or selling Bitcoin with Bitcoin jungle and the bull Bitcoin creation, it's, it's only lightning. So it's a lightning first experience. Uh, most people have no concept of what is on-chain yeah. transactions. So that's, that's really cool. Um, unfortunately, Bitcoin jungle is a custodial wallet. Um, so that is not for me, the optimal path. Um, but however, um, hundred percent of the payments <laughs> are working, right? So yeah. the, the payments actually come from, uh, so bull Bitcoin and Bitcoin jungle have like a lot of lightning channels open together. So the, the, the Bitcoin payments come from bull Bitcoin's node to the Bitcoin jungle, uh, wallet and a uh, hundred percent of the time it works. So at least that's, that's good. So yeah, there was no other option than bull Bitcoin. Um, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna obviously pop up. I mean, there, there's a, there's a significant, you know, Costa Rica is a small country. It's like 5 million people or something. I, I guess it's, it's relatively the same size of El Salvador yeah. pr pretty much. Um, it's, they're, they're very, very similar countries. Uh, I mean, Costa Rica is much more developed. I think the, yeah. the GDP per person is like two to three times what it is in El Salvador. Yeah, yeah. Co Costa Rica also has uh, a lot of people working as international like remote workers. So a very typical job for someone in San Jose is gonna be like customer support for a Canadian bank. You know, that's, that's like if, uh, if, uh, uh, phone phone support, IT support, like Microsoft hires a bunch of, uh, of Costa Ricans. Um, so um, I, I definitely see a lot of so it's it, it, there's not a lot of expats also like uh the costa rica th there's not like a huge costa rica diaspora uh that's that's yeah. a huge difference with el salvador where, where where in el salvador like remittance from the el salvador and their diaspora to el salvador is a, is a huge part of the economy yeah. um i don't know the stats so i might be pulling this out of my ass but i am not aware of a pretty big costa rican diaspora all over no, the world they never really had a reason their yeah. economy developed you yeah. know, early on and they've com especially compared to the rest of the region yeah costa the standard of living has been fairly high yeah so. and costa rica has been blessed with uh, a rather rather peaceful like last 80 years of history um so doesn't have an army yeah, i think they were famous yeah for disbanding their army and... yeah yeah they, dis they disbanded their army in the late 40s i think after the last civil conflict or civil war or I should know my, my Costa Rican history a little more um, but it, it prides it prides itself on its civility and uh, I don't want to say docility but you know um, it, it's it's kind of like a Canadian <laughs> type yeah. country you know it's it's a Canadian ish country people are not um, very just politically aggressive like politics are, are are pretty pretty docile compared to to other countries like there's there hasn't been a there hasn't been any dictatorship or civil war in like 70 to 80 years and it's considered like relatively stable um although i have been reading lately you know yeah. i never trust what i read in the news yeah. so i'm curious is your take that that it has become more of a drug hub that the murder For rate is has gone way up and i think is significantly higher than el salvador's now as el salvador's yeah. been coming down there's yeah. been going up yeah so have you seen that there I haven't seen that personally, but I know that for sure the uh, the murder rate in Costa Rica has been increasing, and it's it's, it's a huge problem. It's also obviously a concern. Um, and probably kind of some shocking to the people there yeah. because it's been yeah, so yeah. peaceful. Yeah, over uh, the last decades. I uh, I've been trying to understand a little bit the 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 region of the country where we are, Bitcoin jungle is uh, there. We don't see that. We th there's not like I've never I've never heard of a murder in the okay. last two years, right? So there is definitely not like people getting gunned down on the street. Um, maybe there are, but I really, really never hear about this. So we are living in kind of a I don't want to say like a bubble, but we're living in a, a place where it's it's very, very peaceful and very, very safe where we are. 
Uh, the, but the crime, I think, is due to the fact that Costa Rica is a import export uh, hub for like cocaine, for example, from Colombia. Um, I know there's a lot of marijuana imports. Um, gangs are fighting each other. So, so it's gang violence, basically. Yeah. So I don't know the dynamics of the gang violence, but I know that it exists. It's real in the capital city of San Jose and also in the Caribbean city of Limon. Uh, it's, it's, there are some very dangerous just places and crime has been rising and, uh, people are concerned. And, uh, um, I was, you know, with, um, with Bukele, um, I'm always, uh, I'm always skeptical of politicians, um, just generally, even yeah. the ones that are pro Bitcoin, you know, I'm skeptical of Pierre Polyev in, Quebec, in Canada, you know, he's a Bitcoiner. I'm skeptical of, uh, you know, Vivek Warmazwami, he's a Bitcoiner in the States. I'm skeptical of Millet. Um, and then when, uh, when Bukele started the, the war on gangs, I was, I was kind of skeptical in the sense that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of like author, you know, government, government just crack down and having a strong, you know, internal police military force. However, uh, impossible to deny the results of what Bukele has done. It, it really is like at some point you gotta be like, yeah, man, he's done a phenomenal job of making this country safe. Like whatever else happens in El Salvador under his government, under his policies, um, having uh, get rid of the gang violence in El Salvador is is wonderful. And I uh, I would definitely welcome the Costa Rican government like cracking down on on the gang violence, uh, even though I haven't experienced it, um, it, it for sure, it for sure is real. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, mo I don't know what the stats are, but like definitely that's, there's at least a murder every day or something like that. Um, uh, another, another issue that we have is, um, and that's also kind of like broadened my my horizon about Latin America is we are on the migration trail from Venezuela to the United States. Uh, so we like Bitcoin jungle is on is on a highway. So it's like three little towns on a highway, which is uh, close to the Panama border. And the amount of misery and uh, that the Venezuelan people who are emigrating from they're essentially crossing from Panama to Costa Rica uh, through the jungle and uh, through a place specifically called the Durian Gap, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's 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 awful. Like people die on on that trail, um, and it's all by foot, right? All yeah, around. it's it's like a combination of foot and like bus. Like they'll just kind of like you know they're always kind of like walking, but whenever they can't yeah. get money, they're but, like. But on the the Durian Gap is that's is, on foot. It's all on foot. Okay, that that's on foot, and that's the kind of place where you wake up and your buddy is just gone, you know, people disappear and corpses are not found and kids get, kids, yeah. uh, children get kidnapped and disappear and women get raped. Gangs will just tra track you like an animal in the jungle. It's, it's bad, it's bad. Yeah. And also there is all sorts of other people like uh, from China, from the Middle East, uh, from Africa, from ha Haiti, that are trying to get into the States and they realize that the easiest way is to fly into Venezuela because there's no border control in Venezuela whatsoever. And uh, they go to Venezuela and they walk. So we are seeing the mass migration of people that are coming through Bitcoin jungle. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's tough. Uh, it's cool though. Like we can talk to Venezuelans about Bitcoin, and uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have Bitcoin. Yeah. Actually, that's that's very interesting to see because a lot of people, a lot of people have Tether and stuff like that, and because they are tra traveling on, you know, if you're traveling on foot, like you don't want to have cash. Yeah. Obviously, if you have cash, it's just you're gonna get robbed Target. for sure. Um, so so it's interesting to see. see Plus, that. when you're moving from country to country, yeah. you don't even know which cash will yeah. uh, be usable. Yeah. So. Um, and in terms of like, you know. Living in Central America is 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 not easy. So uh, a lot of people uh, they move to Central America, and then after a while, um, the jungle will spit you out, yes. <laughs> kind of thing. There's a honeymoon period, yeah. and then after yeah. that, the, you know, you yeah, see yeah. If they're gonna make it or not. Yeah, uh, Costa Rica is significantly just for people who are thinking about emigrating. Costa Rica is significantly more expensive than than El Salvador in terms of real estate, like you would be this it's, it's like a Canada level stuff you know yeah. what I mean like a beach a, a, a beach house in Canada in Costa Rica uh, or even not a beach house like a like a, a jungle house a nice a nice like cottage house it's it's sometimes similar to to prices you know in Canada so it's, it's a very expensive place to live um compared to for example El Salvador where the 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 economics are are are, are definitely more favorable um both countries are, it's, it's, 
you 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 gotta you gotta be willing to put in the work if you wanna if you wanna live there. Um, the the difference the thing is also it's it's free it's a free it's a free place. Even you know li living out in Central America, it's it's healthy. Um, that that's the the main reason why I stayed here is that I saw myself becoming like so healthy and energized and. Um, you know, have have a feeling of, of freedom. Um, living also in in small communities in Central America, you realize that uh, uh, people are are there's like tight bonds in like living in a community with tight bonds is is incredibly important. Relying on your neighbors and stuff like that, yeah. it's it's very very cool. Um, I'm super bullish on Bitcoin adoption in Central America um, and and Latin America. So it's it's really exciting to be here because you know. The Bitcoin adoption in Canada is is um, is happening, but you know, it's it's cool, uh, but it, it's 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 really like, you know, to 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 be very uh, kind of I don't know um, caricatural. I don't know how to say the word in English, but it's it's like rich boomers. Yeah, it's it's rich boomers buying buying Bitcoin and uh, as an investment. Whereas here, it's it's people who are. Um, using Bitcoin in a in an econ like as as a as a means of payment. Um, I uh, I believe in the and, and building the the first step. You know, I don't yeah. want to oversell, it, but it's the first steps of circular Bitcoin economy. Where yeah, it yeah, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Circles through the community from one yeah. person to another, not yeah. just sit in some Coinbase account somewhere. Yeah, 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 exactly. And um, I'm I'm a big f I love spending Bitcoin. I spend Bitcoin every single day. Um, I th Bitcoins are meant to be spent. Um, obviously. I know that there is a there's an opportunity cost to spending Bitcoin, but the way that I see it is, if you're spending fiat, you are spending Bitcoin anyway because you could have used that fiat to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. So um, there's no. That's the argument I always have with people, yeah. but they get all no, you should never spend your Bitcoin. I'm like, why do you have fiat? Uh, yeah, what am I supposed? To, what else am I supposed <laughs> to spend? Like I uh, I don't own. I mean, I don't say I don't own any fiat whatsoever. I own very 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 small amounts of fiat. Um, the only way that I interface with fiat at this point is with the Costa Rican, you know, fiat conversion system. But it's like I hold Bitcoin, and when I want to spend, I spend, uh, spend my Bitcoin and convert it to fiat, or I use a credit card. Um, so I'm like I own negative amounts of fiat, not you know. Yeah. So, so I'm like negative fiat. I'm like leverage long on Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of spending. Bit Bitcoin is meant to be to be spent, and uh, well, plus it's just easier at this point. It like is. It's, you know, you have your phone with you. You can. Yeah. You don't even have to be physically there. You can yeah. send it to them. I yeah. mean, it's it just like I always joke with my wife because my wife's like, I'm not a Bitcoin. I'm like, yeah. you've made more Bitcoin like transactions than, you know, anybody you'd find at a Bitcoin conference yeah. just because it's easier. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, uh, I have, uh, you know, landlords that are Canadians. I pay, it's like I, I pay my landlords with Bitcoin, you know, so uh, I live in Costa Rica, but the house belongs to your Canadian family yeah. and I pay them with Bitcoin. Um, and just, just that, you know, it's like I'm... You know, you you can j just the idea that I'm I'm paying some random. It's, it's funny because um, my my girlfriend, um, you know, she she's she's talking, she, you know, she, she's talking to her friends about uh, she needs to pay back her friend in the states or something like that, and like PayPal's not working, Venmo, Cash App, and it, there, there's like a huge discussion happening, like how are we gonna get paid and try to coordinate, like maybe you can open a Venmo account or something like that. My PayPal got frozen, I can't use my PayPal. I'm locked out of this thing, you know. I'm just like, why doesn't why don't you just convince her to like make an account on River or something in the states, and we'll just send her. A Bitcoin there or like can't we just like send a Bitcoin payment and like get this over with that yeah. would take like literally three seconds just Donald blink and like send me an LN address and I'll, I'll, I'll pay it for you um, Bitcoin is definitely uh, I get really triggered when I see Bitcoin Maximus like Bitcoin is not a good means of payment it's a store of value it's like no Bitcoin is a fantastic means of payment you know how I know it's because I've been processing Bitcoin payments for 10 years <laughs> um, so it is a is a fantastic means of payment um, obviously, we have scalability issues, um, and Lightning has scalability issues, and Liquid Network uh, is not being adopted. And there's also sorts of issues. But as a as a there's a difference between a means of payment and a method of a, a payment method, right? So the me means of payment is more of a theoretical, abstract concept where you can exchange value, um, and with Bitcoin, you can definitely exchange value over various payment methods. So you have, for example, Fedimints. Right, you can exchange value with the Fediment payment method. You can use the Galois payment method, which is an internal kind of like database yeah. transfer. Um, you can use the Liquid Network. You can use the Lightning Network, non-custodially. You can use on-chain. 
probably there's gonna, you can use state chains. You probably you're gonna there's gonna be like ten or twelve or fifteen uh, payment rails, which people call layers, but they're really just payment rails over Bitcoin. Um, so uh, like it's it's so funny. Like uh, I feel like I'm living in the future in a way, you know. And and that's that's the that's the beauty of places like El Zante or uh, Bitcoin Jungle or I haven't been to Bitcoin Ikazi, it, but it's it's all these communities that are. Like kind of like agricultural, yeah. or you you go there and you're like, oh wow, it's like they're so not advanced uh, because they don't have the same infrastructure and stuff. But then you're you're living in the future in a place that looks like the past, kind of. It's it's just a phenomenal thing. Um, Even for us to be able to to, to support these other communities yeah. that are happening, if we were trying to send them fiat, it would yeah. a lot of times it would just not even be doable. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Now we can just zap them some sats, yeah. to, you know, when they have a need, and so it just yeah, it's super yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so hopefully uh, we can close the loop on the circular economy. That's uh, uh, and realistically also because Bitcoin it, it, and this is something that will naturally solve itself as um, as the Bitcoin market grows, it will become. I believe it will become less volatile. That's yeah. all. That's all. That's always a theory that I've that I have always believed. Whether or not it's it's founded on. It's not. It's not. It's you know. I I, I, I believe that the volatility of the Bitcoin price is going to decrease over time just based on historical observation and, and just general logic it'll become less volatile and become more circular yeah it'll just yeah, be yeah. less and less need to yeah. go to fiat yeah 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 Which, and i think those two will work together yeah. it'll become less volatile because it just becomes the money that people yeah. are using yeah 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 exactly um and right now it is definitely not as convenient Cir circle economy is inconvenient for a lot of people because they but in also a way you know it's um other fiat currencies are also very volatile and yeah. very unstable, and and at heart. So the argument that you know Bitcoin is too volatile for a business to be, because business want predictability of their money in the future, right? So um, uh, I want to know what my budget is going to be in the future as an entrepreneur. It's like my budgeting is the most important thing almost. Um, if you look at uh, the Costa Rica and Cologne, for example, Costa Rica Cologne, um, good good for the holders, but it has increased by I don't know like. 35 to 40 percent this year versus the US dollar. So everybody who's who holding dollars in Costa Rica have lost 35 percent of their purchasing power this year. Okay, that's that's pretty nuts, right? Well, uh, that, that, it's been crazy. We've seen the same thing in Mexico. Mexico lost, as like, well. The Mexican pesos, yeah. like those. Yeah, you never would have thought that that you'd yeah. be better off holding Mexican pesos than, than U.S. dollars. But I think that shows what we're doing there in the U.S. And, and you know, people that were you, you, maybe they're going to switch back to colonists, and maybe colonists is going to correct, and you know, they're going to yeah. lose another thirty-five. Argentina, same thing. A bunch of these countries, same thing. Um, and uh, if you look also at the uh, the inflation between Canada and the U.S., for example, the difference Canadian inflation is much higher. Um, if you if you have been holding Bitcoin as a Canadian, you have a massive premium compared to like an American person, right? Because uh, Canada's inflation has been um, has been crazy. So okay, um, yes, maybe Bitcoin is volatile, and it is true that uh, it went from you know. But really, not a lot of people buy Bitcoin at the top, you know. So yeah. you're looking at, oh yeah, Bitcoin crashed from like sixty nine thousand dollars to like sixteen thousand. But okay, you know, maybe like zero point zero zero one percent of Bitcoin holders bought Bitcoin between fifty five and sixty five k, whatever. Um, yeah, sure. It, like it lost half of its value over a certain uh, a period of time. But then the difference between Bitcoin losing half of its value over a certain period of time uh, is that Bitcoin will gain value almost yeah. mathematically predictably afterwards, whereas fiat only goes one way except some currencies um, like, you know, the colonists or the Mexican peso. But these, these but, are and not... And that's just temporary. Yeah, yeah. You know over time that they're going to buy less and less. Yeah, 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 like exactly. They're, they're, you know, the fiat games between the fiat currencies. Uh, but, but over time, obviously... Um, you know, whether it's colonists or whether it's US dollars, um, you need more money to buy coconuts this yeah. year than, you know, the same coconut is going to cost you more. And uh, really funny on the side of the road, you know, you have the prices that are spray painted on concrete, you know, it's going to be like 50 cents per, per coconut, like X crossed That's out. That. Now it's a dollar per coconut. Um, you know, well, I noticed in the U.S. The, this last couple of years, the restaurants stopped putting like the menu prices on the menu. They mm. put them on stickers because they're having to change them so much. Yeah, and now we're gonna have uh, dynamic uh, price tags on menus, digital menus that have the dynamic uh, price tags. And eventually, people are gonna be like, you know what? I'm just gonna that. That's that's what I'm looking the most forward to in my life. It's just the price is going to be in cents. 
right? Um, that's when we know we're going to have one. I think we're, I, I wouldn't say we're close to SATs as a unit of account, but the thing is like a lot of you us- You think we're more or less than a decade out? I think, I think a decade is, is probably, it's probably a good uh, estimate, you know? Um, I used to be much more bullish on Bitcoin because I believed that uh, the system was uh, about to, I underestimated um, the ability of the establishment to crush people's spirits entirely. And, and uh, I, I, you know, for example, in the beginning of COVID and uh, I thought this will never fly. Like the, the vaccine mandates can never, like people will rebel. There will be, there's gonna be a civil war. There's gonna be, I, you know, and that's kind of like one of the reasons why I left for Costa Rica. It's because I was like, there, there's, there's gonna, there's gonna be, there's gonna be, there's gonna be violence. There's gonna be conflict. People are gonna rebel. I'm gonna get sucked into this, uh, and I, I like, I don't want to martyr myself for this cause right now. I have too much. Stuff. I, I'm gonna remove myself from the yeah. situation, right? And uh, I was m blown away by um, how how people the lack of resistance. So people just went along. It was yeah, crazy. everybody went. So, so that that has changed my time horizon a little bit. I was like, uh, I thought the system would collapse a lot sooner. I think it's going to take a little bit more time. And the switch to the Bitcoin unit of account is to me completely correlated and linked with the collapse of the fiat system. Um, so people will adopt. Bitcoin um, more as a more in uh, because the, the via negativa way or the uh, a way of attrition, right? So it's it, for me, it's more like people will stop using dollars as a unit of account and then they will default to Bitcoin. It's it's not they're gonna they're not gonna adopt Bitcoin as a unit of account. They're just gonna they're gonna stop using other units of, unit of accounts and then gradually the only one that's gonna be left is uh, it's kind of like a natural selection yeah. process towards Bitcoin. I hope 10 years, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 uh, I've been working in Bitcoin for 10 years. Uh, I hope I can retire from Bitcoin in 10 years. I wanna do something else, you know, I'm like uh, uh, getting a little tired. So uh, hopefully in 10 years, you know, we, we've, uh, we've gotten the, the unit of accounts and uh, we've won. Um, whether it's 10 years or it's 20 years, um, I'm, I just, you know, I just had a little girl. It's changed my perspective. Uh, I, uh, I don't think she'll ever own Fiat. I think my kids will never own Fiat. And uh, uh, that's, that's my goal. I, I, never, I, I never want them to ever have to touch it. Yeah. It's, and, and it will be the first generation that have been, f Fiat money is inherently evil. It, it is evil. Um, it's evil uh, because it's uh, it's slavery, because fiat is created b with debt and debt by people who didn't agree to contract that debt, um, which is the future generations. It's e it's evil because of how it's created. Yeah. It's also evil uh, with what it enables, which is um, which is you know oppression of peoples, um, misallocation of capital, socialism, and war, right? And uh, and and all, and all of the pain and harm and death that these things cause, like people, people die because of fiat, uh, it kills people. So um, when you are participating in the fiat system, and th that is really when I, s I, I became a real Bitcoiner was when I decided to opt out of fiat because uh, it was uh, just, just like a vegan might opt out of eating meat, you know, and, and even though you love it uh, and it's it's convenient, it's just like ethically, I'm not a vegan, but like <laughs> like ethically speaking, I was like, by holding fiat, I am, I am providing value to the fiat. I'm complicit yeah. in the fiat crime. You're part of the system. I'm part of the system. I'm complicit and, uh, and uh, I, I refuse to be complicit. Um, holding fiat makes you dirty. It makes you tainted as a person, um, unfortunately. Even though you we we don't want to, we we are tainted by fiat um, at a like you know spiritual level even. So uh, hopefully the next generation, like our kids, uh, the 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 Bitcoin boomers, <laughs> the baby boom Bitcoin boomers, um, in some way it's like they're gonna be they're gonna be pure at least on on the monetary side. They will never have participated in this like historic crime against humanity, which is the the fiat system. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty confident. So we are, yeah, we're, we're, we're also reaching a point where Bitcoin is, uh, has Bitcoin has definitely passed. So Bitcoin has passed the, the, the level where it can be attacked and destroyed. Yeah. 
No, I agree. So, so we're no longer vulnerable to a state level attack. Bitcoin is at a point where now it's like, it will succeed. Uh, we just need to make it affordable for transactions and like make it, uh, you know, more, the worst case scenario, honestly, at this point is like, it's just a lot of custodial Bitcoin stuff, right? So, so it we, gets co-opted. <laughs> Better get co-opted, but yeah. but but we've definitely succeeded in like Bitcoin is definitely not going away. There's there's no scenario in my mind where it collapses. Um, uh, so that's like the first step is insulate Bitcoin from state level attacks. We I was on a panel like is Bitcoin decentralized enough? It's never decentralized enough, but it's 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 uh, decentralized enough um, to resist these kinds of attacks, and then. Um, how fast is uh, is fiat going to collapse? Well, I mean, uh, the the clown world fiat stuff definitely seems to be accelerating. Um, doesn't seem to be slowing down. I am quite quite confident that uh, climate change, the climate change culture, um, and the culture of uh, the Generation Z, the, the thing I see, they, they're very depressed. They're very they don't have a lot of uh, a meaning in their life very atheistic, um, nihilistic. And uh, for me, that's just a, that's just, just like a snowball effect. Like um, things are just, th things are just gonna get worse. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the thing about Bitcoin is it is a life raft. It, uh, it's uh, the, the, li the lifeboat, you know, doesn't need to do much. It just needs to be there when the ship sinks. Um, and as the ship starts sinking, People will just uh, be glad that uh, that is there. So, the, like, what what we need to do as a Bitcoin community is just make sure there's enough lifeboats for everyone. Make sure the lifeboats are accessible. Um, that's why I don't I don't I don't want to convince people that that much to like adopt Bitcoin. I I do in a way, but I'm not like uh, in a rush to like get Bitcoin adopted by the masses. Um, even though that's what I do in Costa Rica, but that's, you know, that's also because there is a messianic aspect of Bitcoin. I like, I like to preach Bitcoin a little bit, but it's not a problem if, if people are not um, rushing to adopt Bitcoin because, um, this, you know, uh, life jackets on a sinking ship don't need like a marketing yeah, department. You don't need right? to sell them. Yeah. You don't need to sell them. You just, you just need to be there and they need to just work when is there. So that's, that's what uh, we're doing. We're making sure that it's work working and accessible for everyone for when they need it. That that's all that matters really. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good note to, to wrap up on. Yes, we can go join, uh, everybody that's enjoying the beach here today. Yeah. Instead of sitting here in this uh, studio, but yeah. I want to make sure People in Canada know sure. where they can go to buy Bitcoin from a Bitcoin only exchange. And then time also for my in spiel. Costa Rica. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, so in Canada, uh, Bull Bitcoin is a, is a Canadian exchange. You can buy Bitcoin. And it's only Canadian customers that can buy from you. Is that correct? Uh, currently, it's Canadians and Costa Ricans. Costa Ricans yeah. uh, however, uh, we are expanding. Uh, so Costa Rica is the first country that we've expanded to. I am uh, hopeful to start serving Mexican customers and Brazilian customers um, sometime in the next year, European customers as well. Um, if you're Canadian uh, and you want to purchase Bitcoin, you can purchase Bitcoin with cash, with no KYC, ooh, under a thousand dollars, a very, very popular new feature that we've launched uh, this year at the Canadian post office. So. You can walk I in. love that you've co-opted the post office. It's so. uh it's fun because I'm providing a new line of revenue for the Canadian government kind of in a way because it's a crown it's a government corporation the post office. So, uh yeah, you can walk into a post office with cash and buy bitcoin on Bull Bitcoin by depositing cash at the post office, which is super cool. Uh, if you're a bitcoiner, uh you can live off of bitcoin pretty much uh, our bill payment system, you can pay off pretty much any bill, um your landlord, your staff, something like that. So, so it's really cool. So, it's bullbitcoin.com. If you're in Costa Rica, um, just download the Bitcoin Jungle app on the iOS store or Android store, and uh, you can buy and sell Bitcoin using the Bitcoin Jungle app. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Francis Pouliot underscore. Yeah, and you never pull any punches. Uh, that's yeah. why I love I yeah. love following you. Because, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be uh, enjoying the surf. Yeah, you got to get out there. The, the, yeah. the weather's yeah. so great today. Yeah, uh, so. everybody should come to Bitcoin Beach. It's a lot of fun, and that's a great place to learn how to surf too. Perfect. Get out in the water. I need to get out in the water. Yeah. <laughs>